So I'm Howard Tao, uh, Muse Games, and we're the dev for uh, Gun Circus Online. And this presentation is all about managing your community the hard way. Um, so we are a studio, indie studio based in New York City. Uh, we develop uh, pretty much exclusively in Unity. And so far, we publish uh, to Steam, iOS, and a few other different platforms. All right, so what is, so yeah, Oliver's right. Gun Circus Online is a pretty crazy game. So what is it? It is a steampunk airship combat game. Um, it is unique in a sense that it is really all about teamwork. Um, it is probably the most teamwork heavy and teamwork oriented game out there. You crew with an airship with three other players. You can pilot the ship, shoot big guns, uh, and run around and repair. So you team up with uh, other airships and battle against uh, enemy airships in disguise. Uh, you win and die uh, as a team together. All right, so we are now more than seven months in how we're doing. Uh, so far, we're pretty fortunate in that you know we're on the top of Steam for uh, you know a few times. Uh, we've sold over 200,000 copies, and we distribute primarily through Steam and uh, Amazon and Greenman Gaming, and we were a part of a couple of bundles. And so the start was really, really rough. Um, we had a publisher relationship that turned horribly bad. Um, we, we were, um, basically, I mean, we were starry-eyed, and a, a publisher uh, approached us, and we end up entering into a, a co-development relationship with them, where they pay us to uh, develop the game, and they have the exclusive right to publish the game. And ended up, it turned out to be um, not as what we expected. Um, so in, after the honeymoon period is over, um, they, we, we kind of battle for creative control pretty hardcore. Uh, we wanted to keep to our steampunk aesthetics and our vision, and they wanted to make uh, big eyes, big boob, uh, anime girls. Uh, we kind of didn't like that a lot. Um, and they promised to pay us, uh, end up they snuck, on, snuck in a bunch of features and didn't really pay us uh, all that well. So we, we decided to back out, um, and they basically, when we, when we left, I was on the phone with them, they're like, hey, uh, so you wanted to back out, right? Um, can we just copy your game and keep making the game? Like, what the? Um, so that that was that was uh, pretty rough. It was a rough start, um, but luckily, you know, we still backed out and we're still, um, you know, where we are today, uh, fortunately. Um, but you know, the crux of the story was that when we left that relationship, um, we were so reliant on them to build a community, to promote, and to publish a game that you know we had. 10, 10 likes on Facebook. So we started with nothing. And, and after that, we're like, okay, what do we do now? We're, we're free, but what do we do? Um, one of the first things we did is actually uh, this little thing called Kickstarter. Um, at the time, it was really this little thing. It was before Double Fine. We did it two years ago. Um, we wrapped up the campaign in November, right before Double Fine, unfortunately. Um, but we did end up being successfully funded. It was $35,000. Obviously not enough to make the, the entire game, far from it but it was the eighth highest uh, funded project, uh, game project at the time. So it kind of shows you how far uh, Kickstarter has grown and how much it's exploded. Um, what we didn't make in money, what we did end up getting was a pretty awesome and dedicated, uh, loyal fan base um, that follow us through thick and thin. Uh, we ended up getting about 1,800 um, alpha players. Um, well, actually, they started a late prototype, so they follow us through alpha, beta, and pre-order, and then the launch of the game. And it was, it was phenomenal, because otherwise we had no way to actually get players to help us test, which we really, really needed. Um, we put them through hell. Um, you know, the servers were like kind of teetering all the time in the beginning. It was constantly going down. We had you know, really rough mechanics for them to test, and they stuck with us. And that was hugely important. Um, and all throughout how we build a, a community, and you know, by now we have about like 12, uh, 12K likes on Facebook, I mean, which is you know, not a huge deal, but for us it's pretty awesome. Um, and I, th I feel like how we grew the community over time, it was really just a lot of persistence. Um, you know, we'll reach out, reach out to journalists, we'll submit our games to awards, and we'll try to attend shows, um, and we get ignored and rejected a lot, but it's really a matter of just keep pushing. Um, and sometimes the you know, unexpected and awesome things can happen, so one day, we're just sitting around, you know, sipping coffee, <laughs> kind of having a relaxing morning, and all of a sudden, it, it, and we were just playing in game at a time where the game's usually, you know, there's not a lot of players around. 
Um, and all of a sudden, there's this huge influx of, of players, and they all speak Russian. We're like, what, what was happening? And as it turned out, a week later, some players told us that it was because um, there's these two famous Russian casters that just somehow stumbled upon the game and did a, a cast in a playthrough. And all of a sudden, you know, our, our mornings are exploded with Russian players. Um, and I think what's really important in, in, once you have a little bit of community to speak of, what's really important is to, before you launch a game, to kind of sit down, look yourself in the mirror, look ourselves in the mirror, and decide who we want to be, what kind of community we want to shape. And this is a multiplayer game, right? So it's, you know, it's really upfront uh, with our players. There's, you know, players that come into the game, you're expected to maintain the game and update the game. So it's really important for us to kind of sit down and just define uh, what community we want to shape and how we want to interact with players. And what we decided was that we want to be really connected to our player base. We want to engage with them as much as we possibly can. I mean, it's, it's a risk that you know, we decided to take because we thought it was just, you know, it's, it's cool. Um, it's cool in that way. So and that ended up driving our support principles and gave us um, a way to channel our feedback in that to, to improve the game. Um, so in support, we decided to kind of do it the insane way, which is to basically not, uh, not ignore anybody and to respond to everybody as fast as we possibly can. And we felt like we wanted to be really nice to players, even though they're ranting at us, yelling at us, cussing at us, um, because we felt like, well, people pay their hard-earned money uh, to buy this game. So in, in a way, um, like the earlier presentation was saying, we are providing a service. It's not just a product, that, a game that we created. Once players are in the game, they're active in the game, we wanted to, pre, uh, to provide a service as well. And everybody does support in our team. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but if everybody does support, we're also empowering everybody to basically do whatever it takes. So it, whether it's a you know, soundtrack, a free copy of the game, some in-game items, um, we'll actually do whatever it takes if it's our fault to um, make players feel happy. Um, but I mean, this is all fine and good, right? It's all talk. Um, but really, in the moment, moments of crisis is what defined us, I felt. And there was no greater moment of crisis at the moment we launched the game. So that's actually the day we launched the game. It's Hurricane Sandy, it hit New York, October 29th, and that's, uh, that's when we launched the game. And that photo was taken a block away from our office. It was totally closed off. We had no internet, no power for a greater part of three, three weeks. Um, and obviously players, was a, you know, we were, I think, number two on Steam, whatever, in, uh, in Indie. Um, and we had a lot of players, or servers teetering, Steam servers teetering. It was a disaster. A um, lot of players were, with support issues and whatnot. So my teammate Conrad, um, this is a, a drawn by an intern actually. So our, 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 my teammate Conrad actually biked in from Brooklyn. Um, our lower Manhattan was sealed off, right? And uh, it was really dramatic. And uh, so he evaded some security guards, police, whatever. <laughs> Snuck into our, our, our room, grabbed the server to deploy Bill, dish his bike. Um, and took a cram super crammed bus uh, all the way uptown to my apartment where I had internet and power. And that's how we spent a greater part of a few days. When he was deploying bills, um, I was basically handing his support. Pretty much all day and night. And that's kind of how we survived our first week. Um, and what I would say is that, yeah, in the moment of crisis, um, a lot of things, I mean, in, in the lifetime of a game, a lot of things can go wrong, right? But really, what we decided to do is just be upfront with the with the player base, right? I mean, we still had access to Steam Forum, our forum, so we're just like, look, I mean, this is what's happening to us. Um, I know you guys have problems, um, so we were just really upfront about it. And by and large, our our community is actually pretty understanding. The players are actually pretty understanding, and they stuck by us. Um, and in doing support, especially an online game, everything that happens between, you know, a malware on their computer to an Ethernet cable being unplugged. Unity having problems is all going to be our fault. Um, they have, our players have nowhere else to turn to, and they will basically shoot us a hateful email and say, hey, I'm having problems, fix it, and fix it now. Um, I think it's really a matter of just us taking the issues head on. And I think over time, over the last seven, eight months, we've accumulated a lot, a lot of knowledge um, because we were able to individually answer people's emails and individually solve people's problems. And I feel like over time, we accumulated a lot of knowledge um, and you know, if we solve one issue for a, a player, then we can translate that to other players. So it's actually pretty important for us to, to do that, I felt. And 
the way we manage support is all stress driven. Um, in the beginning, we had a lot of, um, um, I guess, point of contact with our players. Um, and to the point where we were basically driven insane. So what we decided to do, I mean, we still had to talk to players on Steam Forum, um, on YouTube, on Facebook. But what we decided to do is just drive everything to one support email, and that funnel gets funneled to uh, everybody else. And we have a pretty simple um, ticketing system that we created using Google Docs, actually. Um, but the good thing is that everybody can see it, and everybody can update it uh, in real time. And that drives, so we have a you know, master list of feedback, and we lock just about everything. And so the feedback gets into our split, sprint planning. It gets into our, you know, our product development pipeline. And I feel like this is why support means everything. I mean, you guys probably can't read that fine print, but it's a, you know, in the beginning when um, we had problems, uh, especially at launch, players write us hateful things um, on Steam, um, and they had problems, and they would voice their um, frustration or anger in a very, very public manner. So take the case of Arcturus. Um, so this guy had this end up being a rare case of connection issue. He had a uh, wireless router that disrupted this, you know, model a wireless router that happened to disrupt uh, UDE package communications um, with our server. So he can't connect. And so over the course of a few days, um, we got on actually got on Skype calls with him, and eventually figured it out. Um, so we end up bypassing the issue and figure out what was happening. And what's cool about it is that once we fix this problem, he ended up writing us an awesome uh, recommendation on Steam, right? And he um, <coughs> followed up his post and also in a very public manner. And I felt like this is why, like individual, I mean, right now, a thousand hours later, he's still in the game. He's one of the you know inf influential player, one of the, the, the super awesome hardcore players in the game. And I feel like this is why you know every support ticket matters is because if you can solve it for them. Um, while that you can basically turn a hater into some of the most loyal following fans in the game. Um, and going from feedback to production, I would say, honestly say that um, for the first three months, let's say, launching the game, it was obviously, you know, we had you know, performance issues and, and whatnot, but launching the game was also rough on first players um, because our game has a pretty unique set of uh, mechanics um, and is not the easiest for players to pick up. Um, and we felt like the game is so heavily on teamwork. Um, initially, we just kind of left it to players all on a court to figure it out. I and mean, that's kind of our mindset. Um, but we realized that you know, after players submitting a bunch of first play videos and a lot of really detailed feedback, we felt like, OK, wait, we really needed to do something. So over the last uh, three months, based on player feedback, we added things such as uh, moderation, basically like just more robust moderation tools, scripted tutorial, um, in a combination, which is basically kind of a you know end of the match, give players a thumbs up, um, and give them a you know combination for sportsmanship. And it's really a nice way to for players to recognize that wait, I'm playing with a, another human being, um, and that actually that that those kind of little mechanics end up adding a lot to uh, just basically reinforcing you know the, the positive spirit of the community. And I would say that our intentions greatly improved, and we probably would not have done it if we didn't listen to player feedback. Um, so lastly, I would say that you know, player is really the lifeblood. Once you have a little community going, uh, it's really fun, right? Um, players now are organizing community events. They're organizing tournaments, leagues. Uh, they're doing you know, community events, there's bounties, bounty hunts, uh, fan art, and whatnot. And really, all we have to do is just sit back and empower them and give them as much tool as possible to make it happen. And that is really, as it turned out, is really what drives like, you know, word of mouth. Um, there's nothing more powerful of a promotion tool, tool that just letting the fans have fun in the game and outside the game. So in conclusion, I would say that there's really two things. One is that you know we wanted to focus um, very early on and decide who we want to be. And second, it's just really a lot of dedication. There's really no silver bullet for us. Just a lot of um, persistence, try and error, and failing. That's it. Thanks, Rob. That, I think that was fantastic, and uh, it mirrors a lot of my experiences as well, uh, which I will probably bring in as questions as later. But anyone in the audience who's got a question before I sort of launch into my tirades of lovely questions? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've been mucking about. So, yes. Hey, Howard. Um, I was wondering, like, if as a single player, if I come into the game, how do you 
teaming up with the other team players. I know oh, yeah. it takes I mean, a few. You can basically hop into any this? match. Um, so if you come into the game, you can basically hop into any, any match and just join a pub match, right? Um, there is now a new player zone that you know new players can kind of duke it out with each other. Um, if you come in as a um, just basically said a, you know a group of players, you can you know form a crew together. There's a party system now in the game, so I can do do it one of few ways. So the question is that with our game, occasionally you have the one user that just keeps on complaining no matter how much you try <laughs> to reward them. It's like they complain, it's like they didn't get their coins, so you give it to them and they just keep on complaining to a point where we sort of just starting to ignore him. Cause yeah. Do you guys, have you guys ever encountered those absolutely. type of users? Yeah, um, that absolutely happens. Oh, yeah. And uh, I mean, I, I would say like, yeah, we do try our absolute best, right? We sometimes would go in great lanes um, just to, to make the players feel happy. But sometimes, you know, you just, it's hard to satisfy, right? And that's, I mean, I think it's funny because at some point, you know, other players can jump in as well. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like after we've done everything that we can, you know, the player's just not happy with the game, then he's not happy with the game. So yeah, it happens. So have you hit that 100% uh, support ticket success rate? Or has, is no. there any, like, so what I mean, do you I do? I feel like we respond. We, we respond about 100%. I mean, we respond. I would say we respond 100% of the time. Sometimes, you know, we'll forget a ticket and we respond a few days later. But as far as, like, solving player issues, no. I mean, it's, um, it's something that we strive for. Um, but sometimes it's like, oh, okay, you know, the players get frustrated and, or, or, you know, we follow up and, you know, in the communication chain kind of uh, breaks down. Sometimes they figure out issues on their own and whatnot. But yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll strive for 100%, but do we get 100% when? No. I mean, but, you know, it's, I think just something that we shoot for. So, I mean, I, I, I've been doing community services for a very long time. Um, back in the Wireplay days, uh, what we found is that I mean, given that we had games like Quake and Counter-Strike and Unreal, uh, a hugely passionate audience and, and like you said earlier, you know, very prone to just attacking you if anything went wrong. Uh, made particularly bad because the way Wireplay was set up, BT had one point of internet access which had every ISP on it, including us. But um, what I found is by engaging the community to help with the moderation process as well, that that actually helped, uh, you know, not just calm things down, but actually help manage that process so that it felt much more like it was the community of as a whole. Yeah. Uh, are you finding the same thing, or is it is it really hard to scale? Yeah, that? Actually, the one thing I forgot to mention is that um, so as far as like scaling, um, so it, we obviously try to do everything ourselves, but it's not just us. So like uh, pretty early on, we had a group of players who approached us and be like, "Hey, you know, we want to do more with the game, um, be more involved. How can we do that?" So we started this uh, community ambassador thing. You know, where like players who have spent time in the game, who are pretty knowledgeable in the game, who are willing to help new players, um, we will basically give them a, a you know a, a designation. You know, so we give them a different color name. We give them like you know access to you know our say community calendar and whatnot. And they actually help us moderate our forums and help help us like teach new players. They will, they will go into new player games and, and teach and whatnot. And that was actually immensely powerful. So I think, yeah, like, like you said, I mean, we do rely on, um, you know, veteran players quite a bit. And we had a very old situation where we had somebody trying to hack our email servers back in the day. And it turned out to be a 14-year-old kid. And we sent the police over. Because as British Telecom, we had access to some of the best security people on the planet. And these police turned up on the door of this kid's house, his parents and everything. And we decided not to prosecute. That kid turned out to be the best community manager we have ever seen. He was the most fanatical. He was the most incredible community guy I'd ever. I've, I've not seen anything since either. And we've seen similar things, maybe not quite so extreme, but even on PlayStation Home, we saw these kind of groups of people who, when they engage properly, they don't just sit there. They actually go out and they talk to people in, yeah. in their avatars and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I, I think it's an amazing area, and I think community... And I think it's great that it ties in very much with what we had Sebastian talking about earlier as well. So I just want to thank Howard. And if anyone's got any last questions? Last questions? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you very much, Howard. Yeah, Fantastic right. presentation.